So now that we have a general idea of what nucleic acids are, let's take a more detailed look at the components of nucleic acids. So as we discussed previously, a nucleic acid is a linear polymer. Now, linear simply means we have a beginning and we have an end. And this is in contrast to circular nucleic acids that don't have a beginning and don't have an end. Now, the polymer means we have these individual subunits that link together to make up the nucleic acid. And in nucleic acids, these monomers, these subunits, are known as nucleotides. Now, every one of these nucleotides consists of three different groups. We have a sugar molecule, we have a phosphate group, and we have a nitrogenous base. So let's begin by discussing the sugar molecule found in our nucleic acids. Now, we have two types of nucleic acids. We have RNA and DNA. And these two different types of nucleic acids contain two different types of sugar molecules. In fact, the RNA and DNA nucleic acids get their name from the type of sugar that is found within the nucleic acid. So let's begin with RNA. So RNA contains the ribose sugar, and that's why we call RNA ribonucleic acid. On the other hand, DNA contains the deoxyribose sugar, and that's exactly why we call DNA deoxyribonucleic acid. Now, let's take a look at these two sugars. Let's, let's compare them and let's contrast them. So, each of these sugars contain six carbon atoms. So, we have carbon atom number one, so one prime, carbon number two, two prime, carbon number three, three prime, carbon number four, four prime, and carbon number five, five prime. And the only difference between these two sugars is the fact that on the ribose sugar, we have this hydroxyl group attached to carbon number two, but in the deoxyribose sugar, deoxy means we don't have that hydroxyl group attached to the second carbon. So, Although both DNA and RNA molecules contain sugar components in their nucleotides, DNA contain a, ribo a DNA contain a deoxyribose sugar, and what that means is it's simply a ribose sugar that does not have a hydroxyl group attached to that second carbon. Now, what exactly is the meaning behind the absence of this hydroxyl group? Well, it turns out that because that hydroxyl group is not present in deoxyribose sugar, that actually stabilizes our structure of DNA because it makes it much more resistant to hydrolysis by different types of nucleophiles. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. So the absence of the hydroxyl and the second carbon of the sugar molecule found on DNA makes DNA more stable and more resistant to hydrolysis than the RNA molecules. Now let's move on to something called a backbone. So previously when we introduced nucleic acids we said that a certain part of the nucleic acid is known as the backbone. So before we discuss what the backbone is, let's actually discuss how the different nucleotides are actually linked together in our polymer. So remember, just like in proteins, we have these monomers known as amino acids linked together by these special bonds known as peptide bonds. In nucleic acids, we have these monomers, our nucleotides, linked together by special bonds known as three to five phosphodiester bonds or phosphodiester linkages. So let's, the S, okay. So what exactly is a three to five or three prime to five prime phosphodiester linkage? So let's take a look at the following subsection of our nucleic acid. Now notice because this sugar doesn't have a hydroxyl group on that second carbon. So this is carbon number one, carbon number two, three, four, and five. Because there is no oxygen here, that means this must be a DNA nucleic acid. So we have a single strand of DNA. And notice how these sugars are actually connected to one another. So let's begin with this sugar here. 
This sugar contains carbon number three that contains our oxygen. And this oxygen attached to carbon number three is attached to a phosphate group. And that phosphate group is in turn attached to this oxygen here that is linked to carbon number five of this adjacent sugar. And that's exactly what a three to five linkage actually means. So we have this oxygen on the third carbon is linked to this oxygen on the fifth carbon of that adjacent sugar. Now, what do we mean by phosphodiester? So phospho means we have this phosphate group in between these two ester bonds. So these two bonds are the ester bonds and that's why we have the di because we have these two ester bonds that are linked together by the phosphate group that in turn link together these two sugar molecules in a three to five fashion. So that's what a three prime to five prime phosphodiester linkage is. So the hydroxyl group on the third carbon of one sugar, so this third carbon, this is the hydroxyl, the oxygen of that hydroxyl, is connected to the hydroxyl group on the fifth carbon of the adjacent sugar. So this carbon here, this is the oxygen of that hydroxyl group. And they're connected by this phosphate group. And that's exactly what we mean by three prime to five prime phosphodi as the linkage. Now, this entire chain, as we can see, basically consists of these repeating units that are composed of a phosphate group and a sugar. So we have phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, and this continues until that nucleic acid ends. And this is what we call the backbone of that sugar, so uh, of that nucleic acid. So the backbone of our nucleic acid consists of a chain of repeating sugar phosphate units as shown in the following diagram. And by the way, these are the bases, the third component of a nucleotide attached to this carbon number one of each one of these sugars. And we'll discuss what these nitrogenous bases are in just a moment. These bases are not part of that backbone of the nucleic acid because unlike these, the bases do actually change as we go from one nucleotide to another nucleotide. So the backbone that does not consist of these bases but consists of these repeating units does not change and remains constant throughout that entire nucleic acid. Now, what else can we say about this backbone? So, notice that because the backbone contains these repeating phosphate groups, and because the phosphate groups carries a negative charge, that makes this part of the backbone hydrophilic, so water-loving. That's because we have a dipole moment that exists as a result of the charge that is delocalized among these two oxygen atoms within our phosphate group. So notice that the phosphate group contains a negative charge and this means two important things. Number one, when we place our DNA or RNA molecule into an aqueous solution, which is the solution found in our cells and inside the nuclei of our cells, the structure of that DNA molecule and RNA molecule will basically exist in such a way as so as, as to make sure that these phosphate groups actually interact with the polar water molecules. And as we'll see in our discussion on the double-stranded helix structure of DNA molecules, these phosphate groups actually are found on the surface of that double helix because they are able to interact with the hydrophilic water Water molecules. So once again, this means that in an aqueous environment, these hydrophilic regions, these hydrophilic phosphate groups will interact with the polar water molecules to stabilize the structure of DNA. Now, that's not the only thing that these uh, phosphate groups actually do. What they also do is they actually increase the resistance of the DNA molecules to hydrolysis. So remember, anytime we have an ester bond, that ester bond can undergo the process of hydrolysis in which a nucleophile essentially attacks that bond and breaks that bond. But 
in this particular case, because we have negative charges on these phosphate groups, these negative charges will repel the negative charge found on the nucleophile and because of this electrostatic repulsion that will stabilize the structure of the DNA molecule and increase its resistance to hydrolysis in the same exact way as this uh, the absence of this OH on the deoxyribose sugar also increase the resistance of the DNA to hydrolysis. So these two effects increase and stabilize the structure of DNA. And so that's exactly why DNA molecules are generally much more stable than RNA molecules and are able to resist hydrolysis with a much higher, um, with a much higher potential. So we see that the, uh, the fact that we have these phosphate groups does two things. It essentially dictates what that three-dimensional shape of that DNA molecule, the RNA molecule is in an aqueous environment and it also increases the resistance of our DNA molecule to hydrolysis. So it makes it much less susceptible to hydrolysis. So this process does not generally take place because these two negative charges essentially repel one another as a result of electrostatic repulsion. Now the final component that we have to discuss, have left to discuss, are the bases. So remember, any nucleotide consists of a phosphate group, a sugar molecule, and a base. So let's take a look at what these nitrogenous bases actually are. Now, unlike in the backbone, where these essentially repeat throughout the entire nucleic acid, these bases do change when we go from one nucleotide to another nucleotide. And that's exactly what allows these bases and allows the DNA to ultimately store genetic information as we'll see in just a moment. So although the backbone does not change, the bases in the nucleotides do vary from one monomer, one nucleotide to the next nucleotide. And there are two categories of bases. We have purines and we have pyrimidines. So let's begin with purines. So in DNA and RNA, we only have two types of purines. And a purine is basically a molecule that consists of two fused rings. So we have adenine and we have guanine. So adenine is given by A and guanine is given by G. And these are the two molecules. So we have two fused rings. So the difference between these two molecules is the presence of different types of groups. So in this particular case, we have this nitrogen containing group. And in this case, we have an H. In this case, we have a nitrogen containing group. But in this case, we have a carbon oxygen double bond. And that will play an important role in determining the types and the number of interactions that are formed between the different bases in the double-stranded DNA molecule, as we'll see in our discussion of the double helix. So in RNA and DNA, these are the two purines that are common, that exist. Now, what about the pyrimidines? Well, this is where our RNA and DNA molecules differ. In DNA molecules, we have two, uh, two pyrimidines. One of them is thymine and the other one is thinus, uh, cytosine. But in RNA, we have the cytosine, but the thymine is replaced with uracil. So let's take a look at the following three diagrams. So we have cytosine, which is found in both RNA and DNA nucleic acids. In DNA, we have thymine, but in RNA, the thymine is replaced with uracil. And notice that the only difference between thymine and uracil is the presence of this methyl group. So in thymine, we have the methyl group here but in your cell we have the H atom that is replaced so uh, we, we have this methyl group that is replaced by the H atom now what's the importance of these bases well one importance is in the double helix structure, these bases are used to basically hydrogen bond with respect to one another and they form that double helix as we'll discuss eventually but the more important reason the more important uh, f a fact about these bases is that 
because it's these bases that essentially change as we go from one nucleotide to another. It's the sequence of these bases that essentially determine the type of genetic information that is stored within that DNA molecule. So the sequence of these bases is unique to the nucleic acid that we're studying. And because it is the bases that vary from one nucleotide to the next along that linear nucleic acid, it's the sequence of these bases that ultimately allows the DNA to actually store genetic information that can be used to basically synthesize many different types of proteins. And we'll discuss that in much more detail when we'll touch upon the genetic code.